do you need to hit start? No, I'm good. All right. Hello and good afternoon and welcome to all of our viewers. Thank you for joining us today. I'm excited to moderate today's webinar, Driving Diabetes Equity in the Heart of Oakland, Building a Sustainable Community Approach. My name is Anna Norton and I'm the Vice President for Community Engagement at NMQF's Center for Sustainable Healthcare Quality and Equity. At this time, I'd like to share a little bit about our Drive Diabetes program, which focuses on nutrient dense food access diabetes self-management education and support, medication taking and weight management. We strive to educate our clinical partners along with community-based organizations to build models that pinpoint communities and affect change where it's most needed. Our drive, demonstrating real improvement in value and equity toolkit is designed for primary care teams, healthcare systems and community organizations to help improve health outcomes for diverse and minoritized populations. It brings together the most effective tools and resources based on learnings from communities themselves. And the result is a rapid quality improvement QI cycle approach with strong patient, clinician, and team orientation. We currently host DRIVE programs in various cities and in different disease states. But today we will be sharing details about the work in Oakland, California. I'd like to thank Novo Nordisk for their support of our Drive Diabetes program in Oakland. First of all, I'd like to introduce our first panelist today, Dr. DeLorean Ruffin. She currently serves as the Director of Research Evaluation and Community Health for West Oakland Health Council. She has been instrumental in NMQF and the Center for Sustainable Healthcare Quality and Equities Diabetes Drive program. The West Oakland Health Council was established over 50 years ago, becoming the neighborhood anchor for healthcare, health education, food and housing programs, and even voter registration. Their mission is to improve the health and well being of the communities it serves by providing the highest quality of health care and treatment for its diverse patient population in Alameda County. Welcome, Dr. Ruffin. Thank you for having me. All right, welcome everyone. Thank you for attending. Thank you for having me. Um, as Anna noted, I am Dr. Lorraine Ruffin, the Director of Research Evaluation Community Health for West Oakland Health Council. I was part of this project, came to West Oakland. Um, it was a two-year timeline project uh, for, the PD, for two to four PDSA cycles. This is our first PDSA cycle. Um, the goal for that was to reduce the reduction to A1C of our patient population in general that are diagnosed with uh, diabetes. The second goal of our PDSA cycle was to improve the medication taking adherence um, for our patients in that similar population. And the focus for the third cycle um, is that health education and food pharmacy extension with our weight management for biometric. And then we'll continue on with the fourth cycle and evaluation. Next slide. So here's our patient population um, that we were able to capture. We had 728 participants that were diagnosed with diabetes. The average age range for that was about 57 between 20 and 75 years old. Um, this is the breakdown between race, race and ethnicity of our patient population as well. Next slide. So when it comes down to the evaluation of our A1C levels, we're able to dictate that the A1C levels were essentially um, overall 
there's no significant change that occurred. However, in general, over 60%, the majority of our patients were able to uh, decrease or maintain their A1C levels. And we see that depicted here in this change over time graph. Thank you, go ahead, next slide. And so with our medication adherence, this is this the goal of our uh, second PDSA was to increase uh, medication adherence levels for our patient population. That is that behavior that we wanted to impact. Um, and we see that indicated here between our 2022 data and our 2023 data thus far at our, a little bit more than halfway point. Uh, we see variances within the data from high uh, to low, where in 2022 at our high point, we were at 45 and at 2023, as of April 101 for those levels of medication out here that we're able to capture and collect. So that's significant improvement for us in our patient population that we want to highlight as a positive outcome. And so some reasons for that um, here, one includes the breakdown and reconstruction of our quality improvement PDSA workflow for this particular project. We had an overhaul with multiple sessions of our clinical champions, including our RNs, uh, medical providers, and clinical staff, where we sat down and uh, reconfigured our workflow step by step and included that 30, 60, and 90 day follow up to ensure that we were uh, closing gaps and missing our, not missing opportunities uh, for care. Next slide. The other contributing factor to some of these results includes the inter interconnectivity with utilizing our resources with community partners. That's where Bishop Nation um, and his group come into play with us by being able to make that connection um, and build that relationship. We were able to utilize each other's resources. And so we were able to leverage that by building capacity and space uh, with a trusted partner, with another trusted community member or partner that our patient population can also be familiar with and engage and build opportunities to uh, provide additional uh, food distribution events. This, re uh, this resource we were able to leverage with uh, Pastor Nation Church allowed us the space as well as a resource to utilize. Uh, we were able to go from one food distribution event to now multiple throughout the year or throughout the months so far. Um, this is one of our most latest food distribution events where we had about 156 participants come out um, and participate, which is a major, major positive outcome for us. Usually we teeter around like the 40 or so uh, mark for participants, but this we had a great turnout um, and just being able to leverage that, being able to engage directly with the community with another trusted partner really provided the equitable outcomes for those communities of color that we want to see. Thank you. Any questions or comments that I can follow up on? Yeah. Well, thank you, Dr. Ruffin. And I would like to remind our audience, if you have any questions, you can put them in the Q&A or in the chat box. Um, on the webinar screen, you can see that. Um, Dr. Ruffin, thank you for sharing some of the highlights of the Oakland project. Now, what I'd like to do is introduce Bishop Eric Nation. He comes to us from the Hope Center Church in Oakland and works with our Faith Health Alliance to bring health education, health literacy, and action to his congregants. And as Dr. Ruffin shared, he also collaborates with clinics to bring education to the populations that need it. He's going to talk a little bit today about how to normalize conversations surrounding diabetes and how the congregation has learned to work with people that live with diabetes through this program. So welcome Bishop Nation, take it away. I'm sorry, Bishop Nation, you're muted. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. So uh, a little backdrop, I, uh, I've been pastoring for 22 years. My dad was a pastor, my grandfather 
was a pastor. My dad pastored for 40 years. My grandfather pastored for 40 or 50 years. And one of the things that I've noticed and we found out is that the community, especially the African-American community, uh, tends to not want to go to the doctor because they're afraid of, you know, getting some bad news. Uh, a lot of uh, our, our people in our race don't have health care. So there's really a disconnect between the doctor and that individual. And the church has been a liaison between the two. Uh, what we've noticed is that uh, when things happen, even when COVID hit, uh, a lot of my members weren't going to take the vaccination until I got up and said, hey, you guys, you know, God not only gives us doctors, but he helps them get the information that they have so they can best help us to serve us, which now allowed them to go ahead and trust because there is a lack of trust within our community based upon a whole lot of things that have happened, uh, not only coming through slavery, but just how things are. So we have now decided not only to partner with various entities, but we've also decided to work with them so we can bridge that gap between the different communities. And what I'm noticing is that uh, a lot of people now are going to the doctor, they're getting checked out, they're getting checkups. And what they're doing is they're, they're becoming fully aware of the health issues that are going on in our community. So it's really been a blessing. And then partnering with you guys has been incredible. Our, uh, we did a, a Bible study health uh, clinic one night and it was incredible. And I didn't, I wasn't fully aware of how many members I actually had in my congregation that was dealing with diabetes. And I have a large number of members of my congregation dealing with that. And that night was very, very, very helpful. And there were a lot of questions that were asked. It was an incredible response. And as we do things like this, it's kind of bridging that gap and it's allowing our people to get the attention that they really need and, and uh, uh, things that they need to do. So that event went really well. Uh, she did an awesome job. Actually the whole panel and everything did an awesome job that evening. And we had a great turnout and we just did it in our regular Bible study. And that's something that a lot of churches need to do because church is more than just shouting and, and, and praising God. God wants us to take care of our bodies. Our body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. So we have to do various things to do that. So it was really a blessing with that. Uh, would you like me to go into the uh, event that we also hosted? We would love to hear about that event. Please share. It was amazing. Hit it out the park home run. Uh, there were a lot of people out there waiting. Uh, people have been asking, you know, what's going on? We were spreading it out in the neighborhood and we had an incredible turnout. And the people were really helped because uh, um, th there's a lot of people hurting and suffering right now, a lot of people. And then when you have health issues, you can shift into depression or whatever. So the event went, went really well. Um, the truck started pulling up and, you know, that that uh, energy starts kind of get going. And as I was walking around, you know, asking people, you know, how did they like it? And what was going on, you know, with them personally? And I was hearing all type of stories and you'd be surprised at how much of an impact this has giving away food because people are hungry. Our homeless rate all across the country, I've never seen it like it is. Now, it's one thing to be homeless, but also to be homeless and have health issues. So that was a tremendous plus. We had a tremendous turnout and I really thank you guys for allowing us to participate. And we look forward to doing that anytime you guys want to, all right? <laughs> Well, thank you, Bishop Nation. That's a wonderful and powerful testimonial. Can you share how many people came to that food pharmacy that was held just last week? Oh, there were hundreds of people there. Um, the the line, it kept coming all day uh, while we were there. We started, I think we did it from 9 to 2 p.m. And we were going, it it, it finally slowed down about 1.30ish, a little after one, but then they were still straggling in and we were get, we literally gave out probably 90, 90 to 95% of what we had. So we had an incredible turnout and the people were really helped. And there were some people that we actually may have given them double the amount based upon what they said. Cause some people, you know, this, that may, be, may have been all that they were able to get. Then, you know, they don't have food stamps. They can't go to the grocery store. So, 
when we saw people like that, we actually gave them double the amount because the goal is to give everything away, not to, you know, hoard it all for ourselves. So we had a tremendous response. And then uh, my members who were helping out, they were really blessed and enjoyed themselves because one thing I've learned in COVID has taught me, if your church isn't impacting the community, then you need to close those doors. So we're trying to impact the community. So it was a great turnout. Uh, we took pictures and I was busy trying to take pictures and work. So some information I didn't even get because I was busy trying to work and take pictures, but uh, we had a good turnout. And then I want to also thank the other vendors. Boss was out there and a couple other vendors that came out and it was really good. And, you know, Boss offers so much. So it was just a great turnout. Great turnout. That's wonderful. And this is a really wonderful example about the way that the healthcare system and Hope Center Church have collaborated because we have held uh, food pharmacies like this before at the health center. And then we asked Bishop Nation, do you have a facility? And he said, I have an enormous parking lot. We can accommodate more people, more food. And that's one of the beautiful ways that the DRIVE program is able to reach even more people like Bishop Nation was was saying hundreds of people lined up around the block. Um, and so that's very powerful. Um, so thank you very much for sharing that testimonial. Again, I wanna remind um, our viewers, if you have any questions, put them in the queue. We will answer them at the end. We know that we have a couple already in there. Um, one of them, I think we already answered. Um, and now what I would like to do is I would like to introduce um, Coco Uribe, she is the community outreach manager at Nova Script Central, and she works with population pharmacists to develop, implement, and execute health education programs at the community level. She also worked directly with the Hope Center Church um, a couple of months ago. And so she's gonna share a little bit about the diabetes educational event that was there and just talk a little bit about some of the questions that were asked by community members and how they really want to learn more about how to ma better manage their diabetes. So Coco, bienvenida, welcome, take it away. Thank you so much, Anna. First of all, I would like to say that I am very honored to have been invited to participate in this, in this session. Um, as she said, I'm Coco Uribe. I'm the Community Outre Outreach Manager of Nova Script Central. Uh, we are a nonprofit pharmacy located in Northern Virginia. What we do is that we provide medication at a very low cost or free to our community through our partner clinics. But we are not just focused on putting everyone into medication and that's it, right? We have this program called Educate Before You Medicate where our main goal is to empower the community to take better care of their health by addressing issues of health literacy and medical misinformation that it's out there. So um, Pastor Nation reached out to us because we've been collaborating with NMQF with our Community Pharmacist Ambassador Program, where we've been creating culturally sensitive educational materials for them, like presentations, infographics, flyers, with the main goal of reducing health disparities among minorities. So they know we are very involved with the community and that we see fa like face to face the needs of this community, like in general, and how important it's to create trust. I think that that was what Pastor Nation was telling before, like um, what he said, like the community trusts you, right? You listen to them and sometimes the community like they don't want to go to the doctors because they don't trust them but they trust you so you hear them and you notice that there were a lot of people who had diabetes or at least we know that if it's not you somebody that you know they have diabetes so that's why they reach out to us and we arrange everything to create this workshop about diabetes so in this workshop, we talk about like basic information about diabetes, complications, nutrition, physical activity, mental health. And I think this is really important because sometimes we just go to the doctor, the doctor just tell you, you have diabetes, you have to stop eating sugar and that's it. But you like, people don't really understand what is diabetes and what happened when you eat sugar, or, you know? So, um some of the questions they asked us in the 
in this workshop that we did was, I think I can like resume in like two topics that it was neuropathy. They were really concerned about like, for example, if they can wear like closed shoes all the time, or I remember somebody asked like, they feel their feet like sleep very often, that if that was like a very bad thing to have. And we tried to like answer the question saying that like it's important to wear like good shoes so they because when you have like neuropathy it means that your nerves are damaged and maybe you can feel like sleep feet or hands or maybe feel like little ants in your hands so maybe when you don't use like good shoes you can injure yourself yourself and you don't notice so we try to answer their questions and the other topic was nutrition. And I think we were talking about like what could be the next topic for like another education. And I think nutrition would be a very good topic to talk about because they had a lot of different questions about like if they can drink uh, juices or what happened if they eat a lot of sugar or something, if it's got like something really bad that's gonna happen to them. And I I just want to open the conversation that I think nutrition is really important. I mean, I'm a nutritionist and I think um, it should be part of like the primary care in the health system, not just like a luxury, right? Because going to a nutritionist is a luxury. Not every people can afford to go to the nutritionist, right? <laughs> Yeah, um, Coco, I think that's really interesting that you say that, that not everyone uh, can afford to go to a nutritionist and that it is, it could be a luxury in some, um, but, um, and that it should be part of primary care, right? So um, well, something that we have heard um, from all three, from Dr. Ruffin and Bishop Nation and Coco is, is this concept of trust. So can we talk a little bit about trust in the community? and how it affects the way that uh, managed care is. So, so Dr. Ruffin, you're in the clinics. So, so when, you, when you sense that people that are coming to the clinic um, are lacking in trust, how do, you, how do you go over that hurdle? That's where we try to uh, dissect the patient experience and some of those qualitative methodologies to really extract the patient experience and what their needs are. So that way we can tailor our methods and activities to what they say that they need specifically. It's not gonna work if we put our, what we think that they need and it's not, it may look differently from the, our patients, our community members perspective. And so it's really important for us to tailor those conversations and tailor our environment within the clinics and within our settings to uh, really make sure that the our patients, our community members feel welcome, wanted, and heard and seen when they do have um, adverse experiences. That's wonderful. So, so the approach is very patient centered. It's all very about very patient centered. Very patient centered, which which is very valuable, and it it allows patients to keep coming back, right? And it builds that trust. Exactly. Um, right now, now Bishop Nishin, you talked about the community efforts um, and the collaboration now with with the, the, the West Oakland um, Healthcare Clinic. How do you feel um, were, was the energy uh, of people at the church events knowing that you're affiliated with the clinic and building that, that same trust? Yeah, it's, uh, it, it's really amazing because in, in my community, as I said, you know, people really don't like to go to the doctor because they feel like they're gonna get bad news and they feel like they're gonna get this incredible bill that they cannot afford. So to sit down with their pastor and for me to share with them, you know, this is something that you need to do because the sooner you go and find out what's going on, the better they can take care of you. So as we share with them and then even having people come into our church uh, to talk with the, our congregation, really kind of bridge that gap where they can now understand what's going on. And they're actually here to help you you know, there are people just like us working, living their lives. So it's not like the doctor is this, you know, you're going to detention in this horrible thing. Well, the doctor wants to treat you so you can be better and not 
things get as bad as they could go. So, you know, the earlier signs, the better we can get things done. So that level of communication is, is really important. And it, it just calms them down to know that, you know what, this person isn't here to try to harm or hurt you. They're here to try to help you. And now we can trust and move forward. And I, and I have members now who are attending, going to the doctor regularly. You should go at least once a year for a checkup. And I've got members doing that now, which is really important. Wonderful. Thank you for that. And Coco, you talked a little bit about the different aspects that um, that that your audience was asking. They were asking questions about nutrition, um, and neuropathy, and uh, diet. Um, so, as part of the conversations, and this is really for all for all three of you. Um, but Coco, you can start. I think, you know, when we start to address both the physical health. Um, we also have to take into account mental health. And there's a question here about mental health. So how, how are mental health questions um, spoken about and addressed when it comes to, to our disparities, cultural and racial disparities? Um, oftentimes mental health is not discussed. So, and we know that it's a big factor in diabetes care and management. So how do you build trust there? Yeah, that's a very good question. Thank you, Anna. So um, I think stigma is one of the barriers that makes people like not talk about mental health, right? Like I think when we talk about mental health, we think it's just like um, a very bad illness that you have and then you they're going to put you in a lot of medication and then you don't want to talk about it, right? But I think right now, there's being like people is more open to talk about mental health and what we try to do while we do these workshops and we talk to the community is actually um open the conversation about like there's a lot of people who has mental health problems it's not just you and talking about that it's going to help all of us not just like having that in your head and that's it that's not a good idea. Like having a support system, it's gonna help too. So we, what we do is we actually try to open the conversation at least in their group so they can talk about it. Excellent. And uh, Pastor Nation, Dr. Ruffin, do you have anything to add there from your perspectives? Uh, yeah, mental health in my community, you know, I'm gonna be honest with you, we, as African-Americans, we don't want to talk to anybody because we feel like if we go talk to somebody, we're crazy. <laughs> and mental health is a serious issue that we all have because it's like uh, anger management. All of us need a level of anger management. We all have tempers and mental health. We all need a level of care when it comes to mental health. And what I've noticed is that uh, we were first saying, you know, Uncle so-and-so just crazy. Well, Uncle so-and-so, his father died when he was seven. He's going through all of this stuff. So he needs to talk to somebody so he can get this stuff out and someone can help him. And what I've noticed is that since we have started having these conversations, I have I have several members who, who see various uh, doctors, you know, for mental health issues. And they're realizing that I'm not crazy but I'm trying to live in this world, which is a whole lot. You know, I have a lot of uh, female single parents raising, you know, young kids or whatever, and they need somebody to talk to to help them with mental health. And, and this is on a whole nother thing, but this is one of the biggest issues that we're having in our community with our young African-American men and the police. A lot of these young men have mental health issues. They didn't have a father, you know, their mother may have been strung out on drugs. And that's some issues that they need to be able to talk about but what happens is the police show up and things turn out, you know, going in the wrong direction. So mental health is very, very important in our community. Very important. Yeah, and I think you brought up a very good point, Pastor Nation, where um, that training with the police and other personnel who interact with individuals who are experiencing mental health issues just need to be more aware. And so... Um, you know, one of the great things about West Oakland Health Council that I uh, liked is that we have um, an integrated behavioral health and behavioral health department where we're trying to make those connections with our community members so that way they have that access 
to those resources um, because it is so imperative to everyone's day in and day out life. Life is hard at times. And so we understand that. And that's the importance of meeting patients and meeting our people exactly where they are so that when we can't provide them that tailored quality care, it would be mental, uh, well, essentially full circle health, the whole person health is my body and soul that really needs to be tended to. And so as being a patient-centered medical home accredited, we you know, we want to make sure that we build that connection to build those relationships with our community members and the trusted partners to make those connections essential. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I'd like to switch um, gears a little bit and just talk a little bit about sustainability, because what our goal here is to build a sustainable model. So can you share with, with the audience how this model has will become or ha is becoming sustainable when it comes to medical adherence, um, better diabetes outcomes, lower A1C levels, um, you know, all of these these different topics that we measure when it comes to sustainability, when it comes to better health outcomes. Um, and I will let you all talk about that a little bit, Dr. Ruffin, I'll ask you to start first because you are the clinician here, but, um, but how is it sustainable when we bring in community partners as well? So that's where I would like to ask Coco and, um, and Bishop Nation to chime in as well. Yes, absolutely. For, so for continuous quality care and quality improvement, we tailored um, our efforts to align with our organizational goals um, in particular with that approach. We wanted to be, really be strategic for sustainability purposes. Uh, we are very grateful for the partnership, the connection with National Minority Quality Forum and our community partners that were able to bridge and make that connection for us so that it is sustainable. Um, we wanted to ensure that our PDSA measures were something that will become a secondhand behavior in nature so that way they can become continuous. We are able to leverage that, le that partnership and resources in a sustainable manner by being able to scale um, and build that connection so that way we have those resources tailored for our patient population to continuously access. Pastor Nation, Coco? Uh, I think what makes it really sustainable uh, for us is the fact that, like Dr. Ruffin, when, when, when people of color go to a doctor's office and they see people of color helping them, it makes them a little more comfortable because now I can kind of be open, not only with my health issues, but with my life and what's going on. And I think that really makes a big difference. I'll never forget the first time I went to Atlanta. Uh, when I go in Atlanta and I see, I go in the bank and I see a uh, African-American branch manager. I see a chief of police as an African-American. Well, it makes me feel like, okay, well, this is my people, my community. So I think when they come in these different facilities and they see people of color, helping them, which can now even better relate to us in our situations, that will allow this relationship to be sustainable and even stronger and a, a, a much stronger level of trust. Uh, I know I have some church mothers, they walk in there and I mean, and it just, I'm gonna be honest, you know, it's, it's a Caucasian guy, 56 years old, where they're gonna be a little hesitant or reluctant. They see a Dr. Ruffin, young African-American female, well, let me talk to her. That's that's their niece. That's their granddaughter. So they're more comfortable, which will allow this relationship to sustain and even grow even stronger. One piece I want to add to that is our our outreach, our community health workers that we've also utilized to make a sustainable project as well. Um, we got them partnered in a very strategic position to where um, they are the ones that are the boots on the ground that have their hands directly. Um, on our patient population in order to make that stronger connection for us as well. So being able to tailor and utilize our community health workers as a model has really been beneficial in terms of sustainability as well, just to add. Yeah, I would like to add for like, basing on in education, just like education, we try to create like a sustainable lifestyle changes and teach them how to do like smart choices and with not just like in nutrition or diabetes, like in all the subjects of their lives, right? Mental health, everything. I think, um, and, and th thank you all three of you for, for those really, really um, 
robust and rich responses. They're you know very thought out. I think something that we sometimes um, fail to think about in diabetes is that it's a disease that is mostly self-managed. And so part of the, of the success of better outcomes is to provide tools to people that live with diabetes so that they can manage in between the appointments, in between the events, in between the community-based outreach, right? So that when there are events, when there are clinic, clinical clinician visits, you know, you're armed with information that you can use in the time between appointments. Um, and that is where the trust comes into play. That is where the community comes into play. That is where the patient-centered um, focus comes into play as well. So um, I think that is also a component to the sustainability of the program because people are better armed. Um, and as Coco mentioned, then you can come back and maybe the next visit talk about nutrient-dense food options. And the visit after that, you can come back and talk about neuropathy. And the visit after that, then you can talk about um, mental health as it relates to diabetes or any other chronic illness or societal issue that you might be facing. Yeah, of course. I think what people really need is education because when you understand your health, you're gonna take care of your health, right? So that's what we need. We need someone to, actually like teach you culturally sensitive you know like audience like target your art audience so it's based like individualized for each community right so that's what we need I think thank you and then here's a follow-up question to that and this comes from one of our attendees so this is specifically for Coco what are some of the barriers that you experienced in educating the community about their disease I would, uh, I think I'm gonna say a language barrier. You know, I, I, we have here like a diabetes program. It's mostly Spanish speaking. And I realized that they don't understand anything. When they go to the doctor, they just don't understand what their disease is. And when we go there and start like educating them and they, you know, start, taking their medications, they start taking care of themselves and they out like we have a lot of good outcomes. So I think I'm going to say it's going to be the, like the language barrier and the lack of trust. <laughs> I think it goes hand by hand. Yeah. Do um, uh, Bishop Nation, Dr. Ruffin, do you have anything to add there um, about some of these barriers? Because you see them as well. You see them in your congregation. You see them in clinic. Um, so what else can you add? Well, I'm going to say that I give a personal testimony. So I had this drug addiction on hostess cupcakes. <laughs> I had to have a hostess cupcake every night after dinner before I go to bed. And I was at the doctor, and this is maybe 20 years ago. And he says, hey, Eric, you're, you're, you're borderline diabetic. You need to make some adjustments. And it literally scared me because my dad was a diabetic. And my dad ended up having one toe amputated because of it. And my dad, you know, in African-American church, they're bringing you fried chicken every Sunday. They're bringing you all this stuff, cakes, pies, peach cobbler, and, and we're eating it. And when the doctor told me that, it really scared me. But then he says to me, Eric, you just need to change your diet. And I immediately changed the diet. Now, if I do a hostess cupcake on Monday, I won't do nothing until Wednesday or Thursday. <laughs> but I made some adjustments so that understanding what's going on and treating it, changing your diet, being a little more healthy makes a big difference. So that education is in incredible and it makes a big difference when you uh, understand what you need to do and how you need to do it. Because being a diabetic does not mean you can't have any sweets. You just have to do it in moderation and understand when to and when not to. So it really helped me personally. And I'm I'm in great shape. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for sharing that personal testimonial. And I think that that helps to build trust as well, right? That you can share that personal testimonial and say, so I still eat that hostess cupcake, right? But then I know that, you know, I, then I know that I sort of have to ease back on other things, right? For the rest of the week, because it's about moderation and it's about education. Yeah. 
Right. So, it is. I, you know, and and it's also, I think, sometimes about dispelling myths that our own communities impose on us. Yeah, I think that's right. a major a major key um, is the education piece, because you don't know what you don't know. And also having real conversations with our people when we're in these encounters and settings and being able to be vulnerable and hone in on that power of vulnerability and say, you know, I have a dick. I used to have an addiction to fruit snacks or, you know, whatever that vice may be for you, just being able to relate to the people so, so that way you can land that tailored information to them that is really so vital because you don't know what you don't know. And it's imperative to educate those who don't know, or like you said, dispel various myths about the disease that can be managed on a slow basis and even possibly reversed with truly uh, a real impact on your diet and exercise. Yeah, absolutely. I love that you're addressing that you just mentioned exercise. You mentioned a little bit about physical activity. Um, absolutely. So, so this is this is a, a follow up question, and I think we can integrate it a little bit with a question that we have in the Q and A. Um, someone has a question about the integration of community health workers, and Dr. Ruffin, you talked about community health workers at the clinic. Um, so, how were the workers trained to educate community community members, but also? are they educated on physical activity and its relationship with people that live with diabetes? Yeah, so we're part of a consortium where our uh, community health advocates are also our trained community health workers. So they're trained specifically um, for advocating for the community members and being able to engage with them to educate on various health topics um, and health disparities and address any social determinants of health that they may experience they may be experiencing as a barrier to care. And so we have them go through that within the first 90 days of employment with our organization. Um, and so that is a secondhand nature for us and an expectation that our clinic staff, including our community health advocates are able to provide that a certain level of health education. Um, what was like the other part of the question? I'm sorry, Anna. Oh, the, um, the part about physical activity and how it relates to diabetes. So are they trained on that? Um, and also, is that a conversation? And then now I have another question. <laughs> is that also a, a topic that comes up during clinical visit? Physical activity? Yes. Yeah, so they're definitely trained on the physical part of healthcare and being able to provide that level of health education to, um, to our patients and make that connection with them uh, for diabetes care and management. Um, the nurses also add on a second layer of health education to that piece um, throughout their encounters with that 30, 60 day, 90 follow up specifically. Um, in addition to that, our overall model is to provide that health education to the patients to again, try to close those knowledge gaps overall. Thank you. So we have, um, there's one more question and it is about food de deserts. Oh, actually there's another one um, about food deserts, which which certainly is related to conditions, um, especially in diabetes. Um, what other resources are available besides the food pharmacy that um, the clinic does and now the church does in conjunction with the clinic? Um, what, what are some resources that can be um, given out to community members to inform them and to continue to help them to eat healthy? And you can all chime in on this. Coco, as a nutritionist, you might have some insight. Yeah. I mean, I think the most important part is to let them know that everything is like a balance. It does. I think the most important part in nutrition is that you don't have to cut out like everything. You know, like sometimes when you have diabetes, you just feel that you don't, you can't eat any sugar. And how, like, if it's your birthday and somebody gave you like a piece of cake, it's not that you're gonna say no, right? So I think to empower them and teaching them, like. There are a lot of uh, different options, like healthier options, or at least if they're gonna have like some desserts, um, what portion should they eat? Like maybe share with somebody else, not just eat the whole thing by themselves. And um, I'm gonna say it's education. It goes everything to education, but maybe resources. I I I think I can look for resources that I'm shared with with you, Dr. Pastor Nation, to, to see if it helps, yeah, to give Absolutely. them, like, healthy options. <laughs> yes, and then NMQF, we have also developed some uh, really wonderful resources that we have shared with the clinics um, about nutrition, 
um, and about you know, healthier eating and options. Um, so this is a question now for all of the panelists. Um, again, on the, the preconceived notion in the community that there's no healthy food available, that it's not affordable in, in uh, minoritized communities. So how do you address that issue? How do you talk about that aside from food pharmacies that are providing nutrient dense food and that's only happening once or twice a month. So what do you do the other 28 days of, of the month? Um, well, uh, one thing that we did at my church is uh, every fourth Sunday now is health awareness Sunday. And what that does is we try to educate. And the reality is, is just like you go spend, you know, two dollars or whatever it costs for a carton of milk well let's take that money now and get buy something that's a little more healthier for you so we have to kind of watch what we eat because you know everybody doesn't have you know a lot of money or like that so what i tell them at our church is simply re-strategize what you purchase when you purchase so because trying to eat healthy can be expensive depending on where you're at and where you go to buy the various things and and then there's nothing like simply and a lot I have a lot of church mothers who have a garden in their backyard and they're growing some of their own food right there in their backyard and that's a good thing to do also so there's some things you can do to try to cut some corners to save some funds and also to eat healthy but not go bankrupt trying to eat healthy yeah I, I'm sorry Anna no, no I, I said that's a that's a great example I would like to add something else that sometimes I think we feel that we need to change everything and we need to, you know, change like all of our diet. And I think having like baby steps, having baby steps, like start changing something, you know, instead of buying, I don't know, like this ice cream, go buy some apples. You know what I mean? Like baby steps. And I think that's going to help a lot too. You yeah, don't definitely. have to go bankrupt. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. No, I agree, Coco. Those small incremental changes lead to long-term behavioral changes. Being able to take, take those small steps. And one way that we are trying to make it sustainable in terms of education is also provide those cookbooks um, that have um, education on the different alternative food options that are also affordable uh, food options with what we do have. So making do with what we do have and making the best and the most out of it um, for those food desert areas and communities um, is one strategy that we have in mind as well as quality um, health education, also incorporating our nutritionists into some of those education sessions with our patients so that way they can uh, be more knowledgeable and aware of what food options, alternatives that they are available to them and where to purchase them as well. We also have a food pantry um, on one of our sites that's available that's often restocked. So if we have a patient that has a food insecurity issues that is notated within their encounter, we're able to make that connection quickly in real time with our community health advocates and community health workers to make that connection and follow up with that patient and provide them a, a bag of food or a grocery bag or whatever they need, however, or a gift card to the grocery store, whatever we may have in stock that is more appropriate to tailor for that. Thank hey, you Anna, very much. Yes. Anna, can I say something? I saw that cookbook. Yeah. And, and so we're putting that on the screens at church because it, it, it's, it's incredible. And uh, I just happened to notice it and I asked, could I take one? I said, yeah. And as I was going through it, cause I don't really cook, <laughs> but we're going to be putting that on the screen. So that, that, that cookbook is incredible. Everyone should try to get a copy of that. Can you share yeah, in the, in the chat, which, which cookbook that is, please? Uh, what, what is, I, I don't know what it's called, but it's the book that you guys had at the, uh, at the, uh, uh, a food pharmacy. I follow up. I'll get it. Okay, Thanks. thank you, thank you. And we will share that, we will share that with our audience. So let us know and, and we will get that out to you. Um, we have time for one more question and it um, it shifts again a little bit. Um, and I think this uh, most appropriate would be for Dr. Ruffin. Um, the, the viewer wants to know if you can touch on the importance of patient-centered approaches in health technology assessments. Oh, it's very important as one issue with our patient population is that uh, we serve a lot of houseless individuals. And so having that technology component for us and follow-up is 
kind of been a, a barrier and a gift and a curse at the same time where we're able to address it for those appropriately in various ways I and mean, meet patients where they are, but then also know that that's an underlying factor for our patient population. Then that, knowing that technology, not everyone has the same uh, access and level of resources to um, access that technology. And so being able to tailor, so some of our practices are by paper for that exact reason. Um, and so not being able to move or progress through innovation too quickly. So where we leave from our patients behind, um, we wanna make sure that we're able to still address and reach back out to all of our patient populations that, have, that we encounter and beyond. And so being aware of those infrastructure issues and gaps within our communities really makes us uh, focus in equitable terms on how we're able to capture some of that data and information. Yeah, that's incredible. And, and it really shows the efforts that you're making to meet the patients where they are, right? Meet, meet the Definitely. population exactly where they are and cater to that. And that is the true definition of being patient-centered. Um, so we, we are out of time. <laughs> and, and I'm sad, but what a great conversation we shared over the last hour. Um, I want to thank Dr. Rafa, Bishop Nation, and Coco Uribe. Congratulations on what you have accomplished in the Oakland community. Um, definitely sustainable, definitely um, something to be admired and to be uh, copied. Um, thank you to Novo Nordisk for your support in driving diabetes equity in this community. And thank you to our viewers for tuning in. We wish you a happy and safe holiday weekend, and we hope to see you at our next webinar. Have a great weekend. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, guys. Thank you for having me. <laughs>